Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Conservative Progress Digital Media Review with me, Jason McKenzie, with Alan O'Kelly from Conservative Progress and our guest today, Matt Kilcoyne from the Adam Smith Institute. If you haven't watched before, it's very simple. We take three pieces of digital media and we use them as a springboard for discussion, kicking them around and hopefully disagreeing with each other. And Alan, I know, is feeling particularly punchy today after Liverpool's success in the soccer, which he told me off for calling. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a piece by Brendan O'Neill entitled, Why We Should Oppose the Cancelling of Rebecca Long Bailey. We're looking at Ryan Bourne's piece in The Telegraph entitled, The Corporate World Going Woke Isn't All Bad News for Capitalism. And finally, from 1828, uh, a blog entitled, The COVID-19 Lockdown Has Proved that Extinction Rebellion are wrong. So first of all, Alan, let's go to you and you can tell us about your piece in 1828 and what you think about it. Yeah, so this piece was, uh, it's a really interesting piece about Extinction Rebellion and about lockdown and what it means for hitting this uh, quite ambitious target of net zero carbon by 2050. And the idea to hit that target would require massive economic change to the, to, to the country and how we operate. Um, and if you think about it, it's going to be a 5% target every year. And we will probably hit that target this year because we have the lockdown. So we had no international airline travel. We had no economic activity. And the costs of that, of hitting that, are huge. And so I think the question that the, that the piece poses is, you know, how, how do we go about hitting that target? But more importantly, surely we should allow business to try and innovate our way to that target instead of saying, well, let's cut. Why don't we try and innovate, uh, get businesses to kind of come up with new ideas, new approaches? You know, we're already seeing a kind of a change in how airlines and airline engines work that would use less uh, 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 jet fuel. We're seeing, you know, increased use of solar um, that may actually be able to help de deliver this. Um, and the other point about the piece, uh, not explicitly made here, but I think is important as a jumping off point is we were signed up to this net carbon target. And whether you agree or not is really immaterial actually, but we've been signed up to this target with very little debate as to how we're going to hit it, what it means for the country and how we go about doing that and what the penalties and what the, uh, the, the benefits are going to be. And you know th these things are going to require really fundamental choices about economic activity and, and how society operates in the next 30 years. And we are nowhere near having that type of debate and discussion. And you know, if we don't start having it soon, you know, we're going to have to make even more drastic decisions if we're going to hit that target, if indeed we do decide we still want to hit that target or not. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the scary thing for me is this was ushered in with no scrutiny, no debate, no opposition really in, in the dying breaths of Theresa May's administration. And people can't even come up with a figure that's believed widely as to how much it will cost. So 50 billion, 70 billion a year, question mark. What do you think, Matt? Well, we've definitely done some good stuff on uh, reducing carbon emissions, making sure that, uh, that our energy comes from renewable sources in the past decade. So there's, there's, we've moved in the right direction anyway. Um, that actually has come with some costs. Some of that has been sunk because innovations mean that uh, we're actually we're not paying as much as we necessarily would. Um, and I, I think, you know, going for these big targets without setting out a plan, without explaining whether they come with punishments or grants or prizes, um, or whether they come with you know, cash rewards in the form of patents or whatever, then is, is useless because it's literally just like saying, I want to be a multimillionaire investment banker. Um, I'm not going to work, explain how I'm going to get there. You're just suddenly one day I'm going to wake up in a nice penthouse in Mayfair. Um, it's not going to happen, right? Like uh, if you say, okay, fine, you will get, you will get punished or you will have um, an, an incentive to do X, Y, and Z, then you might end up with some activity that, that, that shifts that way. And then you can have a proper political debate about it too. But, just a random target stuck at the end of a of the last regime um, seems a little bit seems a little bit like it was you know it was designed to get a legacy for a woman who won't actually see the outcome um, in 2050 about of, of the choices she's made on our behalf and will be saddled with the cost. Oh yeah, um, of course, yeah, that we, yeah, that, like billions and billions. In fact, you know, maybe even trillions of of, of pounds. Um, and yes, yeah, okay, the next generation is asking for some some action on climate change, but that lots of that will happen anyway. 
again, like companies operate within societies that they, they reflect what it is that we want. If we're looking, if it becomes cheaper and it becomes a good thing to, to move everyone over to an electric car, people will want the electric car anyway, but there will still be needs and wants uh, for, for, for products that maybe are a little bit less palatable. So a diesel, diesel four by four, a diesel tractor makes more sense in some places than an electric one that runs out halfway across your field um, and makes it unprofitable to be a farmer in North Yorkshire, similar, you know, they, they, and that and we have to have allowances for that and that becomes messy and which unlike this clear zero percent you know zero target net neutral target um you have to have actual messy real life uh, implications that have to be like that have to be discussed um and it, it was worrying for me i think the thing that really worried me jason was the fact that we had no political discussion about this um it became this totemic thing which everyone rammed through because again there's no political cost for those people who put it into place, but there was a lot of political cost for people who uh, were going to oppose it or even, you know, try and get some rationality around the debate because uh, they were told that they were, they didn't want to save the planet. They didn't want all of humanity to go extinct. Uh, so they were saddled with this horrible normative term of like not caring. Um, but they probably care quite deeply and actually their position is probably quite nuanced and different. Um, and that, what, that worries me. That worries me about the quality of the debate. This was a theme that, that we picked up on last week when we were talking with Mark Wallace. Uh, all too often in public discourse, we are forced to take one of two opposing stances. And, and there's, a, there's a kind of a false dichotomy there. Um, the, the interesting thing for me about Alistair's piece was the final couple of sentences, really, where he says the key point here is that technological advancements are achieved only by embracing capitalism through free and fair markets, not by opposing growth. He says business is a global concept and climate change is a global problem and the former is the solution to the latter. So, so that there's this um, constant thread really in these conservative progress uh, recordings that we're doing that, that free markets are important uh, and, and that, that capitalism is important, not necessarily unfettered, greedy corporatism uh, and capitalism, but, but that, that business is often the solution and that enslaving people and beating them with a stick is, is probably often less compelling and less powerful than incentivizing them with carrots. Speaking of which, I'm, I'm growing my carrots next door and they're miserable. So uh, yeah, <laughs> don't, don't come to me if the zombie apocalypse comes. Right, anyway, sorry. Now, the corporate world, Matt, going woke. What's this all about? Ryan Bourne's piece for The Telegraph. Yeah, so Ryan has written out um, a PR on actually again to, to capitalism and to, and to corporations, but he's saying that unlike the zeitgeist, which says that you know, corporates have gone too woke. They're not really reflecting your values. He says the exact opposite. Um, and that corporates are taking a risk. They're taking a risk that they are meeting the expectations and desires of their consumers. And so some of them have decided to come out for, for some of the recent protests in America, the BLM, uh, because they think that's where the social mores of their consumers are, but also the, reflects the values of the workforces and also their future workforces too. You know, these guys take a, a view, not just 10 minutes down the line, but also a decade on. They know that America's uh, makeup is changing, but also the UK and, and Europe's is too. Um, and I actually embrace this. I do. I, I agree. I think this is a good and fine thing. Um, not because I necessarily agree with the messages that companies take, uh, I don't necessarily agree with L'Oreal coming out for the Black Lives Matters protests and some of the violence um, in the same way that I didn't agree with Chick-fil-A's uh, sort of more homophobic statements on, on the right and maybe some of the more religious groups that we see in the USA that like, are reflected in corporate culture there. Um, but corporations are made up of people. They're not distinct. Uh, they, they are from society. They, they, they reflect social mores. Now, the question is, is it a competitive enough system that underpins uh, the, the free market economy, both in the US and across the UK and the EU, that, that means that when a corporate takes a stance, that if the people don't like it, that they have somewhere else to go and buy something else. Um, and it's fine actually for like, you know, L'Oreal or, or, or a makeup company, Mac Factor or whatever, to say something and be off, the, be completely off, because there's always going to be another lipstick you can buy or there's going to be some makeup you can go and get somewhere else. Um, whereas if you have some state actors that say certain things, uh, quangos that say certain things where there's no recourse, no ability to boot them out, no ability to choose somebody else, that's where you get into real difficulties when people don't reflect the values of the society in which they're operating. I, I think from, from my perspective that there are two points here, one of which we, we picked up on a, in the previous show, is that if a brand, an FMCG brand, say, wants to adopt a particular cause, 
of course, it's entirely within their, uh, within their gift to adopt a cause, to champion a cause, to change their logo to a rainbow color or, or to donate money to a charity or, or to do whatever they want. But or the a think tank, with, Jason, they can they feel free if you're watching at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, commercial break there. Um, but the second point, I think this is uh, possibly more nuanced, is, is that we live in this 5248 world. So any company, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, you know, pay your money, take your choice, uh, chooses to champion a particular cause, the chances are that probably not 100% or, or even 60% of their employees, of their workforce, of their stakeholders feel entirely on board with that, with that cause. So the extent to which a brand can authentically champion any cause, if it's got a divided workforce, some of whom are in favour, some of whom are indifferent, some of whom are against, is, is a question in my mind. And, and certainly I think there is a, um, almost a Shakespearean life cycle to these things. So there are some businesses that are jumping on board because they've got a C-suite or, or, a, or a, a board or a president or an MD or whatever, who feels very passionately and very strongly about a given cause, which is great. Um, the degree to which that's communicated internally and those values are absorbed by the workforce is, is a whole different thing. But then there are those that will want to, for want of a better word, astroturf, they want to jump on a cause in order to virtue signal, in order to be in with the woke crowd. And, and the reality is sooner or later those wheels will come off because people who are passionate about any particular cause will say, it's great that you're uh, saying that you're for us, what are you doing about it? So if there's any discrepancy between the, the brand promise and the reality of what that company is doing, that will be exposed pretty quickly. So the diversity agenda, specifically the ethnic diversity agenda, plenty of companies shouting about having uh, BAME people on their boards who don't have BAME people on their boards. Now, I, I think quotas are always damaging, always unhelpful, and always end up ghettoizing the very people who they're designed to help. But with all of this, the thread running through it is authenticity. So if you say you're gonna do something, you say you believe in something, you've got to follow through, you've got to mean it, and you've You've got to evidence it otherwise you're going to get caught with your trousers down metaphorically alan yeah i, I think that's fair but i think one of the things that strikes me though is that i think lots of companies are figuring this out at the same time as every as as, as everyone else um, and are, are, are learning about these issues you know maybe you should know them already but are, are learning about these issues in real time and then trying to react and respond um, and and you know the cost for a lot of these businesses is quite high if they get it wrong you know some businesses can get, can end up you know a bad tweet or a bad uh, comment can see you know senior executives exiting a company or worse the company kind of folding and you know fair enough that that's a uh, that's the kind of the, the 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 world we're in but i think a lot it's it's an interesting dynamic at play at the moment to watch companies adapting to this and almost now it's starting to feel that these issues which are hotly debated let's say at political level are almost becoming kind of accepted by consumers as well of course you'd you know you you, you strongly support black lives matter or of course you, you strongly support whatever the issue is because you know almost most of society does so therefore i expect the businesses that i use to do the same um the one thing I would say is, it, there, on your point about jumping on board, there is a lot now of, I think there's a difference in supporting and, and, and between using it to, you know, to market and to, 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 for your own ends. And it does sometimes feel like some of these companies are just jumping on a bandwagon and are just, you know, sending out an email about it and that's ticking a box. Yeah. And I think there's, a, there's definitely an element to that. I think there's definitely a high cost to being a first mover. I think that that cost decreases pretty rapidly as like, especially in a big protest moment or a big political moment to come out and say something um, that decreases very quickly, but then it becomes a cost to not say anything. Uh, and then you end up with people saying things for the sake of it and then being caught out and being, and being hit by you know, consumer consumers calling them out uh, for being disingenuous, whether that's a, you know, a razor company that emailed me about, from Australia emailing me about the Black Lives Matter as a protest in America. And I was like, I don't care what this razor company in Adelaide cares about, <laughs> about this issue, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Um, and, you know, or the cookie company in, 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 in North Yorkshire. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. Like, it's like, and, I, and I find it sort of baffling that you think it would. Um, I expect you to care about things in your local area. And in fact, I want you to sort of call those things out because that met, reflects an authentic voice. Um, I, there's, there's a question about 
do these, how do these companies then move on? As you said, Jason, lots of them like are, call, are saying they're going to change and do various things. Now, are they like governments in, in, era, in periods of, of large amounts of change, they just reach for the ideas that are around them. Um, now, if that's quotas and so on, then some of them will find out that actually quotas have no impact. Uh, they'll find that, or like they'll have an impact on profitability, or they'll find that net, there might be network and mentoring uh, groups there, maybe which that actually have a tendency to be more effective. Uh, they'll have things like open and transparent hiring processes, which typically have a better impact um, in terms of making sure that you're not just hiring the same person as yourself when you're like finding your successor, uh, which is one of the sort of real bigger systemic issues. Uh, but if it's just like we're going to have a target for there being a certain number of people, um, well, I've seen that with a number of sort of big four um, have said that, and it's like, well, yeah, because you're based in central London, so I would expect that to be, <laughs> expect you to reflect the more diverse uh, percentage than the rest of the UK economy, and if, in fact, if you were just carrying up on your trend line, you'd hit that anyway, um, and therefore, like, that doesn't look like much of a stretch. Um, and that will be where they become unstuck because people will go, this didn't seem like you, did, you were actually doing very much. You were just sort of, you were just saying what you needed to say in order to uh, escape the heat of the moment when everyone around appears to be sort of like shining spotlights and stuff. And I think that, that, that segues, sorry, Alan, that segues quite neatly to the second piece that, that Matt brought to the table. Now, the rules are very clear. You bring one piece to the table and you're only allowed to discuss one piece. Matt just ignored that. You know, anyone think he was like a neoliberal or something. Uh, there's, there's a BBC piece called uh, Stop Using Our Pain to Attract Black Consumers. And it's by uh, a lady called Joyce Atutu. And the producer, video journalist, is a lady called Olivia Lepedvin. And I'm pretty confident it's Lepedvin. So I looked her up on LinkedIn. And we've got lots of shared contacts in the Channel Islands. So even though it looks like Lepoidvin, I'd just like to tell you that I've got the accent right and I've got the, the inflection right. But, but this piece here is, uh, is very simple. It, it's saying, if you're jumping on the PR bandwagon, stop it. Is, is that the, the essence of it, Matt? Basically, yeah. And I think what, one of the bits in the piece does, that she does very well um, is she goes, she's like, lots of companies have started doing um, CSR, um, which the, what that stands for is just completely eludes, like, eludes me right now. Corporate, uh, social, consumer, responsibility. corporate social responsibility. That's one. I was like, consumer social? No, no, no. <laughs> corporate social responsibility. Um, you can tell it's really important. Um, <laughs> it is really important. But what you have is a requirement from 2006 that companies have to have this, even if it's just a couple of bits, especially in the UK. You have to have it at least a couple of bits in your annual report. And in, for many companies, that becomes absolute throwaway and it's like it's completely useless statements like we care about the planet and it's like yeah that's nice um i don't think that they're that they're, they're taken seriously internally i don't think it's taken seriously by uh, by strategy teams or by the rest of the employees of the workforce or the c-suite um and i think it actually becomes a drag when you force people to act in a certain way look if a company doesn't genuinely doesn't care that's fine if their consumers don't also not care, you know, like if it, it, I don't necessarily need my toothpaste company to care about, you know, various things, a myriad of things, to be honest. Um, I care about their ability to make toothpaste um, and it for not it to not kill me and it, my teeth not fall out and all that kind of stuff. And it's not doing a great job. I don't have the best teeth in the world, but um, there's like, I, I, what I really want is for companies to actually realize that what they're actually, what are they trying to do? Um, and this, this is a good piece because it calls that kind of thing out where it's like, yeah, okay, fine. You've said X, Y, Z, uh, yeah, you haven't changed anything. And, uh, and then there, she calls out a couple of companies in it um, who, have, who have jumped on the, band, on the Black Lives Matter protest and then said, oh yeah, actually we do really care um, and, and started tweeting out and using black models. But like previously they just only used white um and it's like and then it's like absolutely unapologetic about it and it's like i do and there's a certain respect like to the level of like absolute non-care but like if you're gonna jump on a bandwagon you actually do have to care about what it is and then you do have to have like a, like you have to be willing to understand that consumers will notice that you've changed your opinion to suit the weather 
Um, and that's the same for politics. If you suddenly change your political opinion and become a total opposite of what you were before, voters will notice too. Uh, and so the Conservative Party does have to stick to some principles that the Conservative voters stand for. And like the Labour Party has to stick to various things that the Labour Party stands for, whether that's the working class, trade unionism and so on. Um, if voters have moved away, then they've moved away. Uh, and you have to you have to find you know, new common ground with those voters. But if you just switch overnight, you will get called out for being a charlatan, mm. rightly so. So, so these things evolve and, and you know, personally, I, I'm more comfortable when the Conservative Party acts like the Conservative Party. And, and I'm comfortable when the Labour Party stays true to its values and its history and its legacy and its stakeholders. I get very confused when everyone bends in the wind trying to be popular and to go with, you know, whatever the latest uh, thing in vogue is. So, so, for example, and this is kind of offbeat, really, uh, I like our Home Secretary. I've got a lot of confidence in our Home Secretary, but I want to see her pushing the police to enforce the rule of law. And I want to see that clearly. And I think the vast majority, the silent majority of the country want the same thing. But I'm going completely off piste. I'm causing Alan's brow to furrow. And I think he might have wanted to jump in there just before we go on to the final piece. Uh, no, well, I, I wasn't furrowing at all. Um, I was thinking about that. Um, I obviously need to work, work on my thinking face. Um, I, I was making a point actually on this. I, I, it's something that Matt was picking up on and I, about companies and how they, and, and what you were saying as well about how companies approach this. And it always strikes me the same that the problem with all of these things is that, you know, whether you're talking about gender diversity or um, ethnic diversity or whatever else, these are complex issues for companies to solve. You know, they require a total look at how you, if you, if you're serious about um, solving them, if you're serious about having, you know, greater representation at board, great, um, greater representation across the board, um, then you're going to have to look at everything in your company and probably have to spend quite a bit of money in the short term to, to address it. And this is exactly this point. If you're serious about it in the short term, it's probably going to cost you. Um, and that's why I think, going back to that point of, of being a charlatan, this is the problem. It's like, if you're serious about fixing it, well then go away, think about it and fix it. Unfortunately, the benefits could be a couple of years away and the costs will be now. But this kind of issue at the moment of, well, I want everyone to know I'm a good person and our company is a good company is nonsense. And, and Matt's absolutely right. I really care less about the major what the majority of my companies you know, personal values are. I really just want them to make a good product that's, you know, that, that I can use use well. Like I don't, like a lot of people, I don't think a lot of us take our values, our, our lead on values from global mega corporations or even small com companies. Um, sorry, so that's that's my, that was my furrowing, what was about. So, so, so if there are any beard trimming companies out there that want to send Alan a sample, he, he's in need of it between now and the 4th of July. 4th of July. <laughs> Ping, ping us an email and uh, he can, he can uh, have an Independence Day for his chin before the 4th of <laughs> July comes around. Um, third and final piece might be more contentious. Uh, I, I had originally picked a, a piece from Labour List, mainly just to you know, make your eyebrows kind of lift a little bit. But I, I went for a piece uh, by Brendan O'Neill in Spite. And it essentially says that the sacking of Rebecca Long Bailey by, by Keir Starmer is wrong. And let me just quote a couple of sentences. It's a shrill overreaction to the mere sharing of an article. Rebecca Long Bailey's tweet crime was to praise the actress Maxine Peake and to share an interview with Peake that was published in The Independent, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes on to say, Peake said an iffy thing about Israel. Now, before I let either of you jump in, let me just set out my stool. I saw that Guido put out that RLB had been sacked, which made me think, what's going on? Then I saw that she'd been sacked for doing something anti-Semitic. And to my shame, before I read the article in The Independent, I tweeted out, praising leader of the opposition, because credit where credit's due, at last Labour has got a leader doing something serious about stamping out anti-Semitism in the party. Now, you know, I'm, I'm actually very pro-Israel. I think Israel is a, a shining beacon of democracy, despite all of its faults and flaws. And so I'm hyper attuned to things which might be considered anti-Semitic. Um, but when I read the article and I saw, I think, two sentences, and by the time I'd read it, there'd been a, uh, an addition, an editorial addition saying that uh, the Israeli government or the Israeli police refute this claim. So it was completely balanced. I read it and I thought, well, unless I'm going to be the thought police and unless I'm going to second guess what's in Maxine Peake's mind when she wrote this, which I'm not going to do, by the way, and nor should anyone else, then it felt almost innocuous. Yes, 
politically naive of Rebecca Long Bailey to retweet it in a six word tweet with affirmation. Uh, and, and who knows exactly what happened after she was challenged and asked to retract the tweet and refused to. Um, but it felt to me like she's being cancelled for retweeting an article which expressed an opinion. And my view personally on freedom of speech is that it's very, very important. And unless something incites us to hatred or it incites us to violence, we should be allowed to express our opinions. Who's going first, guys? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I disagree with you, actually. Um, not, on the, the, not on your last point. You're absolutely right. People have a right to express their views. Um, even if you know, uh, even if we disagree profoundly with those views, and Maxine Peak was perfectly entitled to express her views, her abhorrent views. I would actually argue they were anti-Semitic, um, um, and I, I think it, not only were they anti-Semitic, they were actually factually incorrect. But you know, that's maybe neither here nor there. Um, I think Maxine Peak perfectly entitled, even though I disagree with those views, to hold those views. Rebecca Long Bailey is perfectly entitled to hold those views, even if I disagree with those views. Although maybe some of the voters of her um, in her constituency might want to know whether she holds those views or not uh, before the, the next uh, election. But also, she wasn't fired from being an MP. She was fired from a position in the party. Um, and Keir Starmer was perfectly entitled to do that. Like the values that she's expressed support for are not the values that he wants to project across the party. You know, you don't have a, you have a right to free speech. You don't have a right to consequence free free speech. You, you know, and, and there's obviously a balance to be struck here, but you know, every day we all abridge our rights. You know, we don't go to work and tell our every, every member of our team exactly what we think of them. Um, you know, we don't, you know, um, express, we generally express views that are in line with, with, with what our organization wants. Um, I think Starmer was perfectly right. Um, but let forget it, it was anti-Semitism. If she'd expressed support for a large number of conservative party economic and social policies, Starmer would equally have been correct for firing her for, for saying she now suddenly supports the conservatives. I, I don't see why Starmer is wrong here. And the very last point I'd make is when you were stamping out something as poisonous and as far reaching as it seems as anti-Semitism is in parts of the Labour Party, I don't think there's half measures. And, and you know, he was clear at the start that he was going to root this out. And he's followed through on that. I think he's to be commended. Um, and I think for the Conservative Party, it's slightly worrying to see a guy as this politically attuned um, as leader of the opposition. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's fairly obvious that Keir Starmer wants to be Prime Minister in 2024. And I'm telling you to get slightly real about that. Um, I think that, I do think it was anti-Semitic. I think there's a reason why she, she chose Israel. Um, I think the Labour Party knows that they have a systemic racism problem against uh, against Jewish people um, and that they have to stomp that out. I think that, um, that Max, I think actually it was worrying for me that the journalist missed the lead that Maxine Peake uh, came out with quite an abhorrent viewpoint and, you know, had to go back and fact check it herself. Like, you know, why wasn't that the thing that she then questioned? You know, that's a line of, it worries me that like journalists miss things with people that they just happen to politically agree with. Um, I think that happens more often on the left than it does on the right. I think things more honest, uh, like scrutiny of our side happens actually, to be honest. Um, but rather regardless, um, I also think, you know, this article, Rebecca Long Bay, like Maxine Peake was criticizing Keir Starmer throughout the article. It was like a big theme of the piece. Now for Rebecca Long Bailey to be sent out, post things out, criticizing her boss, it seems to be that would be the thing you know the first that would be the first strike you know after after like oh yeah that's actually a massively racist thing to, you know hurt someone hurt someone else it, as you say it's a it's a throwaway line in a piece um you may have missed that if you're skim reading it i doubt she missed the criticism of keir starmer and the reforms of the labor party to be honest um i think she left him with no choice but to sack him uh so, but, for, but for him to sack her um and I'm quite glad that he did, actually. I think it sets the tone that he's not going to take any games, any criticism, any, any you know, backtracking on commitments to tackle the issue in that party. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I do disagree with that. I think it's a, I think it's a, reasonable, it's a reasonable act. Um, oh, I, I, I do love a bit of disagreement. Um, it, it, it's very, very rare that I ever find myself on a side of an argument which would appear to be in any way anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Likudnik. 
Uh, I would be. Oh, I don't. I wouldn't. Young. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't say that you are at all, Jason. I do. Very <laughs> honest with you. I. I was also thinking. Yeah, Alan was talking about you wouldn't go into your office and insult your boss, and I was like, that's what my office do every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to fire five people in a minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that there's at least two thirds of us on this call that would uh, that would be very comfortable doing that. Alan's clearly more polite than we are. <laughs> I, I, I think I don't know. I, I have to say, I think Starmer did. You know, I, I think it was it was a good job in terms of if you're just being like, looking at just the politics of it. You know, he's fulfilled. He's demonstrated very clearly. A, um, that he's going to follow up on a campaign pledge that he made. He's, you know, acted decisively. He's demonstrated a kind of a very clear goal in the party, and he's now stamping his authority on the party. You know, I, I think Matt's absolutely right. The number, like this idea that Starmer might have thought, well, I've been, you know, outside chance number ten. I think it's clear that he wants to be prime minister. It's clear he's starting to act like he, like, like uh, being a candidate for prime minister. And it's clear that it appears so far he has the political skills to start making a real fight with. Mm. Okay. I do wonder, I do I wonder just quickly before, Joseph, if you don't I was going to say that's a wrap, but I was going to give you uh, one opportunity, Matt, for a parting thought. So go. My parting thought is that if he continues down this route and he has to keep giving the press scalps, he'll probably come a cropper at some point. Uh, the Conservative Party is doing the exact opposite. Um, you know, where's so Cummings now, Jenrick, of like, does it, do, does it stand by its people? Um, I, I think that's going to be a real issue for Starmer later down the line. Matt Kilcoin, thank you so much for being our guest. It's been a blast. Alan O'Kelly, as ever, uh, those that watch and criticise us for not disagreeing, they're going to be happier at the end of this than they were at the start. And thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Thanks for watching our video. And don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell.